a new box camera from Lumix, a crazy new lens from Canon, Creative Live getting bought up and photographers getting kicked out of some gorgeous places on this earth. Let's get into this. What's going on everyone? Seth Miranda here. This is Adorama Rewind and I'm just gonna run right into this. Starting off with the Lumix BS1H, the new box camera from Lumix. So what is this all about? Well, basically they put out their BGH1, which was a micro four thirds version of this camera. This is the full frame version. So it's almost like, actually technically really it is, the S1H and the BGH1 combined together to make the best of both. So the thing about the S1H is while it was pretty cinema focused, it still was in the body of a mirrorless DSLR. It, it was stills plus video. It did give you 6K and all this other crazy stuff, but the form factor was bigger. Uh, a lot of people that do cinema don't really want that kind of form factor. And the box camera is more compact and basically just like a brain that you can build on, which is ideal for this stuff. The BGH1 is micro four thirds. This is full frame. We're talking, let's go into the specs, 24.2 megapixel full frame sensor. So that means you get the L mount, not micro four thirds. So the lenses that work for Leica, Sigma, and the Lumix L mount system for the full frame mirrorless work on this camera. You get 6K at 24P, and it is a 12 bit raw output over HDMI. But the thing that makes this different from the S1H aside from form factor is also connectability. So you also in this camera get ethernet port. So it's really more focused for like tethering it into a switcher system, rigging it up into a multicam system, right? Getting it up on truss, the form factor is small. So it has the smallest footprint it can while giving you the ability to do what it needs to do. Ethernet is an awesome thing to have and stuff like this, especially for like things like live streaming. And like I said, multicam, uh, this doesn't even do stills. Yeah, you can rip stills out of the video. So that's where you're making your decision with the S1H and this as far as what you want if you wanted a full frame system. Between this and the BGH1, which is a micro four thirds option, well then you're really talking about sensor size. Do you want to have a faster rolling shutter? Do you want to have micro four thirds lenses, the smaller form factor, lighter, things like that? Or do you want to have the ability and quality of the full frame sensors? So Think about what you're looking to film with this. Think about what you're trying to set up with this. Uh, stuff where you're like out there in the wild, I would say you're probably better off with the micro four thirds because of the rolling shutter. If you're panning a lot where the camera isn't stationary or you're shooting things like live events or whatever and there's a lot of fast moving action. But with something like this that's talking head and you're doing multi-cam or like panels or interview shows or talking heads or whatever, it might be in your best interest to go just all in the full frame, especially if you're already in that system using the S1H or the S1R or whatever. I, I'm not sure what your system is, but if you're in the full frame system, this gives you that option. It's pretty cool to see Lumix think about their whole ecosystem here and giving filmmakers uh, all the uh, filmmakers and production in general, just live streaming and just studio setups in general, all these options out there. And if you're curious about more, you can go to our video on Adorama TV. I'll put a link down below for that, obviously. And you can check it out. It's so cute and tiny, I love it. But keep in mind, a lot of people get, I think, uh, misconceived about cameras in this form factor if they're not used to it. You don't just, um, have the box. I mean, we're talking about a camera that has no in internal stability. So what you're gonna do is, Stabilize this camera with grip, support, monopods, tripods. You're going to build it out, put a handle on it, put a monitor on it, all these different things. So it quickly gets built out. And that's also one of the reasons you might choose this over the S1H. Instead of building on top of what's already a bigger body, you would build on a smaller form factor. Though the S1H would give you internal stabilization. So if you're doing more run and gun stuff, that might be a better option for you as opposed to this. So think of it this way. Box camera, really good for rigging up and putting in a multi-cam stabilized uh, uh, stagnant setup. S1H, more run and gun type stuff. And then you're gonna choose if you go into a setup that's rigged up, do you wanna go full frame or do you wanna go micro four thirds? So three really good options out there if you're in the Lumix system or looking to get into Lumix system or looking to build out some sort of uh, production space. All right, wow, I went way too into that. Let's talk about what Canon's doing. Very, very interesting stuff. So Canon has introduced an RF mount 5.2 dual fisheye lens. This is the first dual interchangeable fisheye lens for VR that shoots onto 
a single full frame sensor. This is pretty cool. So each one of these lenses covers a 109 degree field of view. So it makes it really easy to stitch together and post processing for that 360 camera VR feel that you could do with an Oculus. We've all seen 360 video before, but this is the first time you have an interchangeable lens that shoots onto one full frame sensor, which is pretty awesome and really convenient. The manual focus ring right there keeps a very small form factor and it has an adjustment on the side so you can calibrate both lenses for the focusing right there. And it's priced at around two grand, but think of it this way. If you are out there and you have a client list and there's something like, let's say you shoot for like a resort or uh, real estate and they want to offer something special for their clients to stand out. Well, offering something like a VR or 360 video ability is pretty awesome. So if someone has like an Oculus, that real estate company or that resort or whatever can just say, hey, go to a website and plug into this from your browser on your Oculus and you can just look around our property. If you can offer that, you're gonna make that two grand back pretty fast, I think. It's really cool to see Canon thinking about this. It's really awesome that it goes onto something like an R5, right? A really nice high res sensor, stuff like that. And there are, Firmware updates coming for the R cameras to work in co uh, collaboration with this lens, obviously. So if you are looking at this lens, make sure you're up to date on all that kind of stuff. I think this is pretty cool. I think it's really exciting when we see different stuff and more expandability on our offerings to clients, or even if you're just someone that wants to do something cool, this might be a pretty fun toy for you. I don't know, let me know down below if this is something that interests you. All right, let's head over to Creative Live, who was just acquired by Fiverr. Creative Live is an online education platform that's been around since like 2010, okay? Fiverr has been around for not as long, I'd say, but they're two different philosophies. So on one hand, you have Fiverr that offers your ability to connect with creators and get low cost assets that you need from $5 all the way up to like, who knows, okay? Depending on what you're looking for. I actually did a video about this on my own channel where I needed an animated intro for my videos. So I walk you through what it was like going through Fiverr to connect with creators, their price, structure and what you had to do as a procedure to get the assets. I'll put a link to that down below if you're interested, but Creative Live is an online education platform where you go to learn how to do things. So it's like Fiverr, if you want something fast where you're not looking to gain a skill set or spend time trying to learn how to do like graphic design, and then Creative Live where you want to learn something to be able to do it yourself and offer it, maybe do it professionally or up your game for yourself with whatever you're doing out there. So now what Fiverr is basically saying is they want to expand their horizons here and they want to offer the ability for people to learn how to do this stuff. The head of Creative Live will stay on board. That's Chase Jarris. He's still around and he will head up Creative Live. So it's kind of interesting how this is going to work. I'm wondering if, if Fiverr will just be one whole brand name. Will Creative Live stay Creative Live? I'm sure they're going to keep it separated for now. Uh, they are completely different philosophies. They're almost on the opposite ends of this thing. But I could see someone going, all right, I keep on buying stuff from Fiverr for like five to $20. How much is a class on how to do really quick animations for my, my YouTube? I, I, I see it, I, I totally see it. It's very interesting. Creative Live, of course, has been like a staple of online education. I mean, Peter Hurley's classes were like classic on there. So uh, check it out, uh, see what you are looking to learn out there. And, uh, Get ready for some changes. This is kind of exciting. Let me know what you think about that. Are you someone that would just rather buy something really quick to get your content done? Or would you rather be able to just create it yourself exactly how you see it? I think the trade-off there is you might not be able to get exactly what you want out of Fiverr because you're not the one creating it, but you also might not be able to one to get out of Creative Live because you might not have the skill set to create what you're envisioning. Mm, I know, I'm a downer. Hate me all you want. Let's head over to Controversy Land. This was brought to my attention by Ant Pruitt. Uh, so basically what's going on here is they're making it illegal for wedding photographers to shoot in certain places in Hawaii, which are like state parks and all other places, like uh, several iconic locations, places they filmed intros to movies and stuff. And what they're basically saying here is, you need a permit to photograph there. And a lot of weddings happen in Hawaii. A lot of wedding photographers want to shoot at these amazing locations. A lot of their clients want these locations as backdrops. The problem is Hawaii is basically saying that it's not just sensitive on an ecosystem front, but also on a cultural front, that these are iconic places and 
it means something to the culture in Hawaii. There could be rituals going on there. There could be iconic history that went on there. And I can totally understand their point of view of this. Now, wedding photographers are primarily a business and they want to offer what they can to their clients. They want to be referred. They want to make their clients very happy. And their clients are expecting to hire someone to deliver this amazing, I guess, fantasy wedding, right? Like they want to live this moment. For a lot of people, a wedding is like their 15 minutes of fame and they want to have these images to like relive this moment. And I'm sure a lot of them are going to spend most of their marriage paying it off, but I'm not going to get into that. I, saw, I see both sides to this, but I, I kind of am leaning more personally on Hawaii's side. Like you, as a professional photographer, we are tasked with making the, the most mundane black places work. And maybe you just don't offer these things to clients. That's the point of a permit is that they're giving you permission to shoot there. Now they're saying they never want to give out permits for places like this. People are sh flying drones in there. People are shooting in there still. They're claiming they got the permits. I don't know who's telling the truth on that front, but I can honestly see that if Hawaii doesn't want you shooting there, why would they give you the permit, right? Uh, I don't think it's a money thing. I don't think they're trying to make money off it from the permits. I think they really are just trying to preserve the number one resource of Hawaii, which is like the gorgeous world that is the paradise of Hawaii. You know, this is kind of interesting though. We always talk about influencers being the ones wrecking ecosystems, like going to these iconic mountainscapes and all this stuff and leaving trash around or stomping on the wildlife and the fauna and all this stuff. Stomping on the wildlife, I guess not, but like, you know, stomping on like the grass and the flowers and, and, and hurting the ecosystem there to get to these positions and leaving trash around. Are pro photographers starting to be in that same camp? Are pro photographers not caring about where they are and just trying to get the shots? I'm sure a lot of pro photographers are more respectful in some regard, but if they're asking you not to go there and they're asking you to respect the privacy of these iconic spots, I think we kind of have to. Let me know down below if you think I'm crazy. I know I'm making some people angry out there and what else is new? Uh, but let me know what you think about this. It's very interesting. I, I see both sides to this. And honestly, even if you don't get the iconic spaces in Hawaii, I think anywhere you point a lens in that incredible landscape, you'll find a way to make it work and look amazing for the couple. That's just me. Uh, but of course, you can't just make like a, a giant waterfall happen out of nowhere. All right, let's jump right into uh, shout out of the week. This is someone I think you guys should all know. She's a great portrait photographer, well known in Tallahassee, Florida. This is Kira Derryberry, guys. So not only is she a portrait photographer, but she's very close ties with uh, PPA, Professional Photographers of America. She's the treasurer there. She teaches a lot. Uh, does really great stuff, really cool person. I should check out her work and stay up on her. I just feel like she deserves a bit more of a following than what she's got right now. So go ahead and give her a follow, check out all the stuff. She's a great asset, really cool person. And uh, you could definitely clue into what PPA is about through her and stuff like that as well if you're interested in joining that organization. Question of the week. Now, Nikon dropped a teaser for the Z9. I was gonna talk about it, but I'm like, and I'm under 20,000 NDAs and I kind of feel like keeping my career, okay? But a lot of people seemed upset by it. And what I'm talking about is this trailer right here. I'll play it while I'm talking about the question of the week. So they didn't really show much about it. And this is a highly anticipated camera from uh, Nikon. Obviously it's a pro level flagship full frame mirrorless, the first one they put out for the Z series. Now, people are wondering a lot of things. There's a ton of rumors about this, and this didn't answer too many questions, gave you what they said it was, a teaser. What I'm wondering from you is, do we even want teasers? Do people like teasers? What do you guys think about this stuff? Because I feel like rumors are, yay, let's talk about them, and they're almost always wrong. On some level, never really right. They get half of it if they're lucky right. Uh, some sites are better than others. And it's fun to talk about like what could be, right? But it actually kind of hurts the industry when people assume that something that's been in development for two to three years should be about here, but decisions were made for this two or three years ago where they're trying to predict is it even accessible technology? Will it be affordable technology? Do people even want it at that point? Should they change the ports out? Will it be available? Will they get parts for it? There's so many decisions that get made within the years of development that they're kind of guessing where the market will be. So when rumors say it's gonna be eight bazillion frames a second at a zillion megapixels, sometimes it's not gonna hit that mark and expectations become this and reality becomes this and then people go meh. So I find rumors to be kind of poisonous as well as fun, so I try not to talk about them on this show. But are teasers just infuriating? Do you just wanna like, hey, hold your cards to your chest till you're ready to drop them? 
For me, teasers just mean we're getting that much closer to the actual release, which is cool. So it's kind of like they're announcing that it's about to uh, be released without telling us it's about to be released. I mean, we could be weeks out, we could be days out from the launch, I don't know. But let me know down below, do you even care for the teasers? Do they do anything for you? Uh, even if you're like a fan of the brand itself, whatever brand it is, what do you think about them? Do, or do you just like a surprise launch drop and then everybody talks about it? Let me know down below, I'm curious about that. But for now, uh, check out all the links for all this stuff down below. Don't forget to check out the rest of the videos on Adorama TV. There's new videos out almost twice a day here on this channel. Uh, you can follow me at Last X Witness on all social media. If you wanna find some articles for me to talk about on, the, on this show, hit me up on Twitter, DM me on Instagram with them. I'd be happy to take a look at it, see what fits, and uh, you guys can be a part of this. Don't forget to hashtag Adorama Rewind so that I can find those articles also. If you tag me, it also helps with the hashtag. I check that regularly. And uh, don't forget to hit like. It really helps this video out a lot. It helps the channel out a lot, and it's free for you guys to do. Hit subscribe plus the bell to get notified. More videos like this come out. Share this around, and I will see you guys next week. Later.